May it please my ladyship, yes, my, uh, my lordship, I am here on behalf of the appellant with uh, Mr. Will William Duncan, my yes. learned friends Mr. Andrew War and Ms. Anna Edward Stewart are here to be respondents. Thank you. I understand that uh, my lords and my lady would like me to deal with the application to amend the grounds first. Yes, I, th I think that slightly slipped our memory when we were having our pre-court discussion. Well, I, I don't uh, have it, to do is, it that is way. It, no, no. Is it, is it still opposed? That's my understanding, um, yes. Yes, it is. Right, well, in that case, uh, make your submissions about that briefly, um, please. It's just two preliminary points to make. First of all, uh, uh, um, my lady and my lords will have appreciated that our primary position is that we don't actually need to amend yes. the grounds, because these points are already fall within the grounds as drafted. Uh, and also, when I take uh, this application to amend, I would like to do so in the context of introducing uh, the appeal and the main points with, with uh, my lady and my lords to leave. Yes. Yes. So um, there are three uh, key errors that we say the judge made. Two relate to obviousness and one relates to insufficiency. Uh, can I uh, preface my remarks on those three errors by saying we are not under any illusion. We know that the court is slow to overturn the finding of obviousness, but we say that the three key errors the judge made in this case do meet the appropriate threshold. First of all, uh, the learned judge misconstrued the prior art, Sternschanz, and we say that this is an error that my lady and my lords can see from the face of the document and that it undermines the whole of the reasoning in relation to Sternschanz. The first place that uh, the error occurs is in paragraph 152, but it is perhaps clearest at paragraph 186, 5 of the judgment. In relation to the application to amend the grounds, neither of the additional points that um, we have uh, put into paragraph 5a uh, are, are really uh, of importance uh, to, to this point. The second key error the judge made um, was, we say, uh, a finding uh, which he arrived at, uh, which was unsupported by the evidence and which we say no reasonable judge could have made. And that is uh, to find that the obvious path from Sternschanz was to consider further prostaglandin analogues reasoned out from the structure activity work described in Sternschanz, um, the medicinal chemistry approach, as it were. And that is an error uh, which is made primarily at paragraph 181 of the judgment, but it's also repeated in paragraph 183. It was an approach which in our submission was not supported by the evidence of either side's experts. And again, it undermines the whole of the judge's reasoning on obviousness. Now, this is the point to which the uh, two uh, additional grounds in, in the amended grounds of appeal go. And I don't know whether uh, my lady and my lords want to have that in front of you whilst we're considering this point. The amended grounds are in the core bundle tab 19 at page 199. Thank you. So, so just to orientate uh, my lady and my lords, we've got um, some the, the insufficiency point, which is the third ground that I haven't come to yet. Then we've got under the heading inventive step, paragraph 5. And uh, paragraph 5 really sets out the two uh, key errors, we say, uh, the judge made, which I've just introduced. So the first one is to make a finding uh, on what was obvious in the light of Stern Chance, which was contrary to the expert evidence and which he was not entitled to make. That's the obvious path to follow um, once you've looked at Stern Chance. And so we say that is centrally there, uh, and these two uh, sub paragraphs that we've inserted, having seen my learned friend Skeleton, uh, where he uh, said that we need to. You know that these these points weren't foreshadowed are really sub points of this paragraph 5a which is the second error um, which is the error on the evidence um, and then paragraph 5b is the first error uh, the mis misconstruing of stern chance and so in relation to um, those two uh, additional points I want to start with the point about the uh, leader of the team, um, and we say that the judge uh, should have uh, noted in his judgment and taken into account the fact that the 
skilled pharmacologist was the leader of the team. Um, and um, really the point here is that this feeds in to the finding the judge wasn't entitled to reach on the evidence about the obvious steps to take from stern chance. And we say that it's a point that is good both on the evidence and on the law, contrary to my learned friend's submissions. So looking at the evidence first of all, if I could just ask uh, my lady and my lord to turn up Dr. Krauss's evidence. Dr. Krauss uh, was Alcon's uh, pharmacology expert, so the person that we say, and indeed he says, is the leader of the team. And his evidence is to be found in the supplemental bundle at tab two. And I'm hoping that it's on page 17. And if I could ask uh, my lady and my lord to just read paragraphs 19 and 20 to yourselves. Um, the key points to take out of this are that the um, expert pharmacologist, this is in the middle of paragraph 19, would be responsible for identifying a potential biological target or pathway which could be pursued for the treatment of glaucoma and the skilled pharmacologist would then, with the help of the skilled medicinal chemist, develop potential compounds to act on the biological target or pathway. We understand from paragraph 20 what, the skilled, what, what this witness says um, about the help which is needed from the skilled medicinal chemist by looking at paragraph 20, um, the skilled medicinal chemist would be led by the skilled pharmacologist and be responsible for synthesising drug candidates for the skilled pharmacologist to test. So that's, that's the evidence of Dr. Krauss. Can we then also look at the evidence of Dr. Cavalla, which is in the same bundle, the previous tab, tab one, uh, page <coughs> five, that's page five of the bundle. And we need to look at two paragraphs here. First of all, paragraph 29. And then if I could also ask um, my lords and my lady to turn on to paragraph 38, which is on the next page. So if, if you could read both of those paragraphs, please, paragraph 29 and paragraph 38. Cavalla, the skilled medicinal chemist, saying that the skilled pharmacologist is the one with the greatest familiarity with the biological target, and by the time the skilled medicinal chemist would have become involved, the skilled pharmacologist would have an idea of the drug discovery strategy, and paragraph 38, the skilled medicinal chemist would be led by the skilled pharmacologist. Now, why does this matter um, to the second error? It, it matters because... Um, the question, obviously, that we're looking at there is what the skilled team would do in the light of stern chance, what would be the obvious path or paths to take. And if uh, my lady and my lord turns on now to page nine in this same uh, tab, you'll see at the beginning of paragraph 118, first sentence, the skilled team would be guided by the skilled pharmacologist as to whether it would be worthwhile to take any further steps after reading stern chance. And this is why uh, we say this point about the leader of the team is intertwined 
with the error relating to obvious developments from stern shanks. Uh, my ladies and my lord, there are other evidence references on this. Um, I'm not going to take um, you to them because they are all consistent with this. Everyone said um, the leader of the team was the skilled pharmacologist. Now, on the law, because I understand my learned friend to take a point on this, he relies on a couple of authorities. Uh, one of them is Halliburton and the other one is T Tebra and Astellas. Uh, basically, Tebra and Astellas just uh, cites Halliburton. Uh, let's turn this up quickly because, in my submission, there is not a legal principle, unsurprisingly, that you can't have a leader of the team or you can't have different team members with different roles, which is essentially what we're talking about here. Uh, Halliburton is in the authorities bundle at tab 13. And it's just one paragraph, which is marked up as half 14. I'm afraid that these pages aren't numbered. But it's one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs into the authorities, and it's got a red side into the authority, and it's got a red side line against it. Paragraph 14. 14, yes. Thank you. If I could just ask um, your ladyship and your lordship to read that. This is Lord Justice Jacob. It, it is, it is, my lord. And and my submission in this paragraph, what's happening uh, with the greatest of respect, is that um, Mr. Burkle is putting his case a bit high. He's saying that the law requires one member of the team to be the head, directing the others. And um, uh, Lord Justice Jacob it is rejecting that in a way which also perhaps put it, puts it a little bit high, uh, which is saying, certainly in my submission, this isn't a finding that as a matter of law you can't have a, a leader in the team. Um, that, that's the way uh, that my learned friend puts it. And, and that is actually consistent um, with what is said at paragraph 42 of the previous authority in tab 12 that my learned friend also relies on. That's page 10. Um, and that's where Halliburton is cited. And... Um, that's a decision of Mr. Justice Mead, but it also cites a decision of uh, Mr. Justice Henry Carr, um, which, in which he actually found there was a leader of the team. And the point really here is there can certainly be different team members with different roles. That is without doubt. And all really um, that I need for my case is to say that the two experts have different roles and the learned judge did not appreciate that. Now, whether you put that as leader, which is the way that all the experts put it in this case, as we've seen from the evidence, or whether you say they had different roles, perhaps it matters not. But in my submission, in any event, there is not a legal principle that you can't have a leader of the team. Usually film is not the only case at first instance where a team has been found to have a leader. Sure no, I'm, I'm sure my, my lord is absolutely right. Made such a fine thing. It, indeed, indeed, my lord. So that that really completes what I wanted to say about the first additional ground, which, as I say, it essentially only forms part of my my second ground anyway, which is already articulated in paragraph five a uh, and in further detail in in the grounds. Um, the other additional point, which is at five a two, is this question about. Um, whether the uh, judge um, rel wrongly relied on the written evidence of uh, Alcon's experts, uh, which we say was written on the basis of different uh, CGK. And this is a point which we also say feeds into uh, the learned judge's unreasonable finding of fact uh, on the direction the skilled team would take from Sternschatz. So it's, it's another sub point. Um, and essentially, um, it's perhaps worth turning up uh, paragraph 194 and 195 of the judgment to see where this might come into the analysis. And 
that's the judgment is at tab 7 of the core bundle. And paragraph 194 is at page 130. And if I could just ask my lady and my lords to skim through paragraphs 194 and 195. So what's going on here is that um, the, the judge is essentially rejecting two part passages from the oral evidence of Alcon's experts, which we relied on. And he's saying he, he thinks that um, they are not uh, really supportive of our case. Um, and one reason for that is because uh, he says that they weren't enough to undermine the evidence that they've given in their written reports. Now, in our submission, there's an, uh, an error here because, in fact, uh, the written evidence uh, went like this. The first reports said, this is what we think is CGK, and that does not include fluprostanol. Uh, my, uh, my lady and my lords would have appreciated fluprostanol is the compound in the patterns. And so the evidence in the first reports, we say, just on the basis of the completely wrong CGK, the judge does not note that point. Uh, when it comes to the second reports, there is some consideration, as my learned friend has pointed out in his skeleton argument, of arguments or, or evidence put forward in our experts' reports. And he relies in particular uh, on uh, paragraph 74 uh, to 76 of Dr. Krauss's second report. And perhaps we should just turn that up. That's in the supplemental bundle at tab 4 uh, and um, it's under the heading sorry page 60 I probably should have pointed out to make it easier to find um, it's under the heading obviousness over stern chance and uh, what, what the um, expert is doing here is he is responding um, to the defendant's expert's evidence, um, but in our submission he is not considering uh, the correct question because when we get to uh, paragraphs 74.4 and 74.5 and indeed 75 and 76, um, he is actually considering not whether if you knew about fluprostanol, um, what you would do with it, um, but considering um, the question of whether fluprostanol would be the first compound to be tested, or whether it would be any better um, in, than the tanoprost in terms of IOP lowering, that's activity, and or reduced side effects. Um, so we say, um, and I, I can come back to this in more, more detail perhaps later, but we say um, that this evidence um, isn't sufficient uh, for the judge to find in, in paragraph 194 that he can reject um, the oral evidence of these experts on the basis that the written um, evidence supports uh, his view. And um, so that, that is essentially the second additional point. And we say that all goes um, to this finding, this, this main error, uh, which we say the judge made um, at paragraph 181 of the judgment uh, as to what the obvious next step would be from stern chance. And so we say that it is appropriate for us to be permitted to uh, amend if we need to, and, and my, lord, my lady and my lords would appreciate that um, what my learned friend is saying really is a council of perfection. In a way, what he's saying is you've got to put the whole of your skeleton argument in your grounds, um, 
and we well, say there's that. There's an authority of this court that that is precisely what you shouldn't do. Well, indeed, indeed, uh, my lord. Um, and so that is why we say we should be uh, allowed to pursue these points. Um, my, my learned friend certainly had adequate notice of them um, in, in our skeleton argument. And um, unless there's anything further I can assist on in relation to this application to amend, then I'm going to, to sit down. Unless any questions? No, thank you very much. Yes. Just to, to bring no, thank you, Paul. Uh, points forward. Uh, dealing first with the, two, the first of the two points, the, the leader of the team. We're not saying there's any question of law that there should or shouldn't be a leader. The question is, what is the consequence of, of there being a leader? And we explain why the point's a bad one in our skeleton argument, our main skeleton, the paragraphs 16 to 20. Now, the evidence of the fact that the skilled pharmacologist was the leader of the skilled team just reflected the fact that it was the skilled pharmacologist rather than the skilled medicinal chemist who possessed the necessary background understanding of the relevant disease target, in this case, uh, uh, glaucoma, and was also familiar with the relevant biological assays. Now, the medicinal chemist, on the other hand, was more of a journey person who you know, went from aspect to aspect and, and would come involved uh, as and when needed. Now, the knowledge of the biological target possessed by the pharmacologist doesn't detract in any way from the role of the skilled medicinal chemist in making compounds to test against the target. And there's no basis on which to say the judge made the mistake of placing the medicinal chemist as the leader of the team, which is the way that it's expressed in their skeleton. Now, the idea that the skilled pharmacologist is the leader of the team doesn't in any way serve to exclude or undermine the evidence of the skilled medicinal chemist, not least on those issues which fall squarely within the remit and expertise of the skilled medicinal chemist. Now, the observations that we point to in Halliburton and Mr. <coughs> Justice, uh, uh, Justice Jacob um, was that the skilled team is a team with no boss. Each member of the team is assumed to play his or her part. Now, in that case, of course, they all turn on their facts. The suggestion was that the rock bit engineer would be directing the computer modeling engineer, and in that sense would be the leader. But the fact that a skilled team uh, uh, can have a designated leader doesn't exclude the contribution of the other members of the team. And, and in our respectful submission, that's what Mr. Justice Mead uh, was saying in Terra and Estella, citing uh, Mr. Justice Henry Carr. So, Mr. Walk, can you help me on this? Yes. As I'm sure you appreciate, we're dealing here with a procedural question. Yes. Do the appellants need to amend their grounds of appeal to advance the argument they wish to advance? And if they do, should they have permission to amend? Now, the arguments that you're advancing here are really directed to the assessment of the merits of the argument overall. And they may, at the end of the day, prove to be good arguments. They may not. But we don't really seem to go to the procedural issue. Well, these arguments were clearly foreshadowed in the skeleton argument, as I think you said, except. So what's the problem? Well, they can, just as have, I mean, procedurally, they can be dealt with. And I can see, for reasonable procedural expedition, it actually makes sense for them to be dealt with in the round. All right. as, as a matter of procedure, um, the suggestion that is made that these were foreshadowed in the grounds of appeal uh, is is not tenable because the grounds of appeal in paragraph 5a said it was contrary to the expert evidence of the expert which he was not entitled the judge was not entitled to make well if that is a satisfactory ground of appeal that would basically be an open-ended uh, ground of appeal that you could just put into a ground of appeal in any patent action and say well the evidence was contrary to the evidence and he wasn't entitled to make it without any any foreshadowing of what the point is we had no idea that these points were coming until their skeleton argument. And I can fully see the argument against me that, well, you've had the arguments in the skeleton argument, then, you know, what's the problem? I, I, I don't really have a, a, a robust response to that. Which is why you were sent the hint that you needed to be prepared to argue. Well, uh, absolutely. Matthew. And I am prepared to argue. Well, and I, I so, can so see. Shall we, we not waste any more precious time? Because these are very important. and. And, uh, detailed submissions that we need to I, c I can fully see the, the, the merit of that. In, in just, I mean, we've only got the day. We've got to complete the matter in the day. I can I fully see the force of what ladies say. Can, can we, could we leave it like this then? That we, we fully appreciate your um, technical procedural objection 
um, uh, we're not sweeping it under the carpet, but that let's take a pragmatic approach to I it. can fully appreciate that, Rosie. Well, thank you very much for taking that approach. Yes, well, in that case, um, let's, let's carry uh, on I'm on the basis so that um, whilst no concessions are made, yes, you may want some points. Um, so I wanted to come in my introduction to the third round, the insufficiency point. Uh, and we say this is an error of law in relation to the insufficiency squeeze, and, and that in relation to this, the learned judges um, failed to consider what was uh, the um, what was the technical contribution, um, and that he failed to consider the implied assertion of the claims, um, which included an assertion um, that there was. Uh, the side, well, the two side effects, hyperemia and irritation, um, were uh, sufficiently um, were, were not problematic. Uh, and had the um, judge found that um, the implied assertion of the claims included lack of uh, irritation uh, when he came on to consider insufficiency, um, and had he done so, he would then fa have found that there was no data to make lack of irritation plausible um, because it's accepted on both sides that there is no data about irritation in the patent. Um, there is data about irritation, sorry, about hyperemia, but no data about irritation. In those circumstances, he must have found the patent insufficient. And I would like to add to that that although we put the insufficiency point last in our submissions because it is a squeeze, it is important to bear in mind when considering the case on obviousness. Um, and it, in fact, um, I'm going to ask uh, my lady and my lord to do a little bit of multitasking in this appeal. Uh, and whilst we're going through the case on obviousness and the first two grounds of appeal, um, I, I would ask uh, my lady and my lord to play a little bit of side effects bingo. Uh, and uh, every... <laughs> That's perhaps an informal way of, of, of putting it, but the point is, when we come to look at obviousness, uh, my lady and my lords will see that there's a lot of evidence about side effects and irritation, and a lot of submissions uh, and passages in the judgment where uh, what is said is the reason the skilled person would not come uh, to the obvious step of, of finding flucrostanol is because of their concerns about the side effects, including the side effect of irritation. Now that is, when, when my lords and my lady sees that, that is a point in my favour when it comes to the insufficiency point, because there simply isn't any data in the patent about irritation. And if my learned friend has to rely on that, as he must and as he did at trial, then it means that we are right about the insufficiency squeeze. And so, as I say, whilst it comes last in my submissions, it's important to bear in mind throughout the whole of my submissions on obviousness as well. So just now, um, with that uh, introduction, uh, I'm going to just outline very briefly the structure of my submissions. I'm going to come to the background first, uh, briefly, then the first error and stern chance, then the second error. Uh, then I'm going to come to the question of why, absent the first and second errors, Aspire would have succeeded in showing that the pattern is obvious. And then I'm going to come to the third and final error of insufficiency. So uh, in relation to the background, I appreciate that my lady and my lords have read in, and some of what I say now uh, may come as no surprise, and do feel free to hurry me along if I'm taking it too slowly. Well, well we have, luckily in this instance, all had a, an opportunity of, do, of doing a very significant amount of reading in. So I think you... I, I'm grateful for that this. indication. In that case, I'll just take it... Uh, very rapidly indeed. Um, the, the background, and this is a very few topics uh, on the CGK, um, from the judgment, and uh, that's again at para uh, sorry, tab 7, and the, the CGK section starts, um, as uh, my lady and my lord will appreciate, at page 110, but I just want to call out and I'll do no more than that, some paragraphs uh, of important background. So the first one to call out is at page 112, uh, glaucoma and what glaucoma is, and uh, paragraphs 52 and 53, it's associated with an elevated IOP, uh, which, as my lady and my lords have gathered, is intraocular pressure, 
and so when we see IOP, that's what we're talking about. Then um, we come to paragraphs 60 and uh, 64 to 66, where the learned judge sets out some background to get about prostaglandins, and he explains at paragraph 60 that prostaglandins are endogenous signaling molecules that are present throughout the body and involved in the regulation of many biological systems. And uh, there are different kinds of naturally occurring prostaglandins, and he lists the principal ones. And, and one that we're particularly concerned with in this case is PGF2 alpha. And then turning over to page 114, paragraph 64 to 66, uh, under the heading prostaglandins and the treatment of glaucoma, uh, this is important. Uh, because at paragraph 64, he says that particular focus had been on PGF2-alpha, which had been found in phase two clinical trials to effectively lower IOP in humans, albeit with clinically undesirable side effects. Bingo card can be ticked at this point. Um, and um, it had been found um, to be a very potent ocular hypotensive. And um, then at uh, 65, also important, the insufficiency case, despite their IOP lowering activity, natural prostaglandins were not used as anti-glaucoma drugs in the clinic due to their side effects, in particular ocular irritation, pain and so-called foreign body sensation, and conjunctival hyperemia in large blood vessels, a vascular side effect. Ju just to be clear, um, these are the two side effects I've mentioned already, irritation and hyperemia, and hyperemia is essentially uh, at redness. Irritation is, as it says there, pain and foreign body sensation. You really don't want that if you've got to take a glaucoma medication over a long period of time. Um, we then get to the animal models, paragraph 67 to 70. Um, these become important when we look at stern chance. And um, my lady and my lords will see that we've got monkeys is one uh, animal model, as well as dogs and cats. Uh, mentioned in uh, paragraph 68 and um, uh, the other point at paragraph 70 is that um, the experience of pain uh, and irritation uh, can be uh, tested in cats and they're commonly used as a model for uh, ocular irritation. Now moving on to uh, paragraphs 81 to 86. These are also um, areas that the judge found were CGK, albeit after uh, a debate between the parties on this. And um, the first point is prostaglandins, prostanoid receptors, and their classification. Uh, and so um, work had been done, as the learned judge explains, to classify prostaglandins and prostaglandin receptors. And there was significant work done by someone called Dr. Coleman. We'll come back to him later. And in particular, there was a book chapter by Dr. Coleman, um, which is mentioned at paragraph 84. And at 85, the learned judge finds that the receptor for PGF2-alpha uh, was the most, the receptor for which PGF2-alpha was the most potent natural ligand was called the FP receptor. And at paragraph 86, um, another animal model here um, that's found to be part of the CGK is the cat iris model, was a known measure of PFE receptor binding. The next uh, critical point on the CGK is paragraphs 94 and 95. Did the skilled person know about fluprostanol? That was in dispute at trial. Uh, but the judge found that they did, and um, that's at paragraphs uh, 94 and 95. It's mentioned, he says, in some of the Coleman classification documents as a highly potent FP receptor agonist, but which had very low, indeed essentially nil, agonist activity against the other receptor types. In other words, it was very selective, it, indeed more so than PGF2-alpha, and therefore that profile made it highly relevant for classification, and so it's mentioned in um, that particular uh, chapter in Hanch, which is actually cross-referred to in Stern Chance. 
and uh, the judge finds at paragraph 95 that all of that um, that we've just been looking at in paragraph 94 is CGK. So that's my whiz through the CGK, uh, unless my lady um, uh, uh, and my lord have any questions. Well, uh, well we have the limitation about, in 96. Uh, Sorry. Yes, so yeah. I think we're, we're on the same point, which is that um, attention is drawn by the respondents to the limit on the judge's yep. finding as to flu prostanol yes. being common general knowledge. He says yes. 95 to this extent and for this purpose. Um, and then he goes on to the fact that in, in terms of its previous use, merely a, a luteolytic agent in veterinary practice. Yes. So what do you have to say about the limitations on the finding of common general knowledge? My Lord, essentially we take that on the chin and we say it, it doesn't matter to our argument because um, you know that it is a potent and highly selective FP receptor agonist um, and you... Uh, when you're reading Stern Chance, you, the judge actually finds you go from Stern. If you don't know about it, you go from Stern Chance to Coleman. Coleman says there's only two of these um, FP receptor agonists, and um, they are that the, the, he's categorising their flu prostanol and cloprostanol, and um, they are uh, analogues of FP, uh, PGF2 alpha. So, um, coming on now to the patent, and that's at tab five of the bundle. And so, um, page 66, um, my lords will see um, the title, Fluprostanol Isoprofile Ester for Use in the Treatment of Glaucoma and Ocular Hypertension. Priority date, 3rd of August, 1993. So that's the first page of tab 5. And then I'm just going to highlight a few passages in the patent itself, starting on page 67, paragraph 4. Um, the first sentence of which says, Naturally occurring prostaglandins are known to lower interocular pressure, IOP, after topical ocular installation but generally cause inflammation as well as surface irritation characterised by conjunctival hyperemia and edema. And so this is essentially reciting the CGK that we've already looked at, which is PGF2-alpha um, is, is good to lower IOP, but it has these problems of side effects of irritation and hyperemia. That tends to suggest that hyperemia is, is what characterises the irritation, whereas I thought they were two completely separate. Well, my, my lord, I, I agree with that. Um, it, it's expressed slightly oddly, but I don't think that there's any dispute between the two parties that irritation and hyperemia are separate, separate things, um, and certainly separate side effects that are considered um, and known to the skilled person and considered in, in stern chance. Then we go on to uh, paragraph ten which is the summary of the invention, and um, that says it's been unexpectedly found that fluprostanol, fluprostanol isopropyl ester um, significantly, uh, sorry, having the compound structure shown, blah, 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 shows significantly greater IOP reduction than the compounds of Sternchance et al, while having a similar or lower side effect profile. Just to be clear, uh, stern chance referred to there is actually a stern chance pattern rather than a stern chance article. I'm not sure it matters particularly. Again, there's obviously reference to this, the lower side effect profile. And then um, we move well, on. It, I'm sure it doesn't really matter, but just to satisfy my curiosity, to what extent is the disclosure of the stern chance pattern different to that of the Stern Chance article, which is the prior art in this case. My Lord, I'll have to check with those around me, but I don't think it's that different. Oh, let me ask the question. So, my Lord, I'm told it's it's less discursive. Um, so I think that which the, is what one expects. Yeah. Yes. So I think the bare bones are the same. 
Um, Thank you. And then if we um, move on now to page 80 of the bundle, what we see there is example 5. And we don't need to go through the detail of that, save to note that at paragraph 62, um, it explains that compounds A to E were tested for hyperemia in the guinea pig. And so this is where we accept that there is, uh, that there is experimental data to back up the uh, claim that um, fluprostanol um, is okay on the hyperemia side. What there isn't uh, anything or any data about is irritation. So there's no, no test uh, or experiment for irritation or data for irritation in the pattern. And then um, coming on, of course, to the claims, um, just to point out that they are at page uh, 87. And so it's a uh, topical ophthalmic composition for use in the treatment of glaucoma and ocular hypertension, comprising a therapeutically effective amount of fluprostanol isopropyl ester. So can I just check that I've got this right. This is the B2 spec, so this is as amended by the Board of Appeal, is that right? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Now, um, that was all sorry, I was going I to say. Sorry. Before you, you move on, I, just picking up from what um, Lord Lord Justice Muji was saying, um, that you, you pointed out at um, 62, that there's no specific reference to irritation, and indeed the word is not there. Yes. Um, but going back to paragraph 4, it does seem to, the pattern seems to be proceeding on the basis of irritation is rolled up as part of um, hyperemia, as opposed to being two separate things. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I would go that far. I mean, what, what I would say um, about paragraph four is that it's a list of potential uh, problematic side effects. Yes. Inflammation, surface irritation, hyperemia, and edema. And, and obviously, it has to be read through the eyes of the person skilled in the art. And so, Which I um, certainly am not. And so from that perspective, they are going to see those because we know that's part of their uh, CGK. As um, a, a, a separate thing. So, and even, we, even though it's so a there's a missing system. comma, in other words. You, there's a missing comma after the word irritation. Yes, yes. Um, uh, and it, when we come to um, the evidence of um, the experts in relation to um, side effects and, and whether there's any data in the patent about irritation, it's very clear that um, Alcon's expert, Dr. Krauss, is, is regarding the hyperemia data as being there, but not the irritation data. So he's right. not saying that it's all rolled up in hyperemia. That right. is not the position on the evidence. So, um, Just I'd, before you yes. move on, you showed us the claims. Um, yes. Could you explain to me the difference between claim one and claim two? So the difference is, one, one of them is a... a what's known as a Swiss wall claim, and the other one is what's known as an EPC 2000 claim. It's one of these hideous patent things where, um, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it like that, that's frivolous. Basically, um, my lord can assume that they're the same for the purposes of this of appeal, that they're, they're not different, they're just different ways of having a claim to treatment of a, a, of a, a, um, a, with a known product. So, so my, my lord doesn't need to worry about the difference in wording between them. And I think the judge says that somewhere in his judgment. I've forgotten precisely where, but my learned junior will, will look for it. So the claim that is novel is not, is not, is not the compound which is known, but the use of the compound. Exactly, exactly, my lord, exactly. Yeah. And so that's the Swiss use claim. And yes. And that's the claim one. And yes. we needn't worry about the worded claim in claim two, yeah. because it comes they, to the same They thing. are legally different ways of getting around the problem that you cannot have a direct claim to a method of treatment that is not allowed under the European Patent Convention. So the first way historically that was devised to get around that problem was the so-called Swiss form, which is what we have in Claim 1. And then there was an amendment to the, patent, the European Patent Convention in 2000, 
which enabled a slightly more direct form, form of claim, which is what we have in claim two. Um, there is an, a theoretical debate as to whether there is a difference in scope between those, those types of claim, which don't, might matter in some cases, but don't matter in this case. And the reference, I'm grateful for that explanation, which is better than anything I could have put together on my feet. Um, a paragraph 115 of the judgment, which is at page 122, um, or tab 7, uh, is the judge's finding that, that um, well, he just says neither side says there's any difference from claim one. Claim two is a Swiss claim, neither side says there's any difference from claim one. Well, it, that's wrong, isn't it? Claim yes. one is Swiss form. Yeah. Yes. Yes, well, maybe that's another error the judge made. <laughs> oh. Uh, hang on, or maybe we got them the wrong way around. Sorry, oh, I haven't sorry. read them closely enough. You always have to check, and these see it's easy to assume, and it's not necessarily correct. Let's go back. Oh, no, no, uh, so it is the other way around. Sorry, no, the judge wrong. was right. <laughs> I was wrong. I apologise. Yeah, so claim one is APC 2000, and claim two is Swiss. Yes. yes. As the judge said. Right, okay. Um... So I was going to speak um, about the skilled team, but I won't do that now because um, my lady and my lords have got the point that we say the judge, yes. when he considered the skilled team, did not consider the question of their different roles. And um, my lords and my, my lady can check that um, in, in the judgment between paragraphs 26 and 41. He did consider various points about the skilled team, including whether the pharmacologist was, was a prostaglandin expert, which he found in our favour. But what he didn't consider was this point about their different roles and who was the leader of the team. And I've shown you, I think, the key evidence uh, references on that already, and I don't plan to uh, go over them again. Um, so so that um, completes my sprint through the background. Uh, unless my lady and my lords have any questions, in which case I'm going to uh, proceed to the first error. Now, I'm going to have to go a bit more slowly now just to take a, a proper look at stern chance um, because we do say that the judge did misconstrue that uh, and my lady and my lords need to understand a little bit uh, about the whole of the stern chance article in order to uh, understand the, the problem. And so I think what, what it's helpful to do is to have in front of uh, your ladyship and your lordships both the judgment at paragraph uh, 143, which is tab 7, page 126, uh, and that is uh, under the heading Teaching of Sternships. And then also, um, uh, unless uh, my lady and my lords don't like doing this, take out Sternships and have that open at the same time. Where's Sternschant? Uh, Sternschant, sorry, is at tab 14. I'll do it the other way around since I already have the uh, yes. out. <laughs> Absolutely fine, my lady. So um, what, what um, can be seen, first of all, is there's a discussion about um, a two-page introduction to Sternschant, a paragraph 100 and. 43 of the judgment and then um, and, th and that just explains and I won't take it up at this point that um, there is a, a reference to the established effect of PGF2 alpha and its ester in lowering IOP so this is, we've already seen this as part of the CGK but with the side effects of irritation and hyperemia so that's, that's at the end of the introduction and then um, the judge goes on to say at paragraph 144 uh, that there's a long section about general methods for synthesis of phenyl substituted PGF2 alpha analogues. And that is what the paper is concerned with. And, um, and he then explains that uh, latanoprost, which is, is the key compound from this paper, is compound 8. We need to know that when we look at uh, some of the tables and figures. And then he goes on to say that there's a structure activity relationship analysis of the scheme, uh, two compounds, um, and as shown by figure two, they all have marked and um, dose dependent meiotic effect in the cation model, and table one sets out their irritative and hyperemic effect in the cat's eye. 
with a total lack of irritation but some hyperemia. Now what I'd ask um, my lady and my lords to do now is actually turn up uh, figure 2, which is on page 166 of Sternshanks, so we can see uh, what the judge is talking about here. And that's the um, graph at the bottom, uh, which has got reduction in pupillary diameter up, up uh, one axis, and it explains at the bottom that it's the minus effect of 17 phenols substituted analogs in cat eyes three hours after topical application. And so this is what's called the cat iris model, which we've seen in the judgment already at paragraph 86, is a measure of FP uh, receptor binding. And then if we also look on page uh, 168, uh, table one. Table one is going to feature heavily. Um, this is our first look at it. And this is uh, showing uh, the results from two other tests. One is irritation in the cat eye, and the other is ocular surface hyperemia in rabbits. And um, what um, can be seen from that is you've got PGF2 alpha IE, that's, that's the um, that's the naturally occurring prostaglandin. And then you've got a comparison with the other um, compounds that are being tested in this article. And you can see that for irritation, they're all zero. And then for hyperemia, uh, they're all various uh, different results. And they're all, all the results for the compounds tested are all lower than PGF2 alpha. And if you now go back to uh, page uh, 167, uh, you'll see um, that there's a passage um, in the right-hand column uh, towards the top, um, which it says, uh, the marked meiotic effect of these compounds in combination with the total lack of irritative effect strongly suggests that substitution of part of the omega chain with an aromatic ring structure either causes conformation or alteration in the molecule or imposes a steric hindrance which enables a discrimination between different prostaglandin receptor subtypes. Uh, and so that is uh, talking about um, these, these results and um, it's a, a passage that is set out in the uh, judgment at paragraph 146. In fact, the judge starts the uh, quotation uh, slightly earlier. Uh, so that's at, uh, on page 126 of the judgment, bottom of the page, paragraph 146. And um, it, in the judgment, he explains that the reference to prostaglandin receptor subtypes is to some receptors uh, listed in the left hand column of table 3. Um, my lady and my lords don't need to turn that up yet, but obviously you can if you want. Uh, we're going to come back to table three in a minute. Um, and um, he then goes on uh, to say that the IOP um, effect of scheme two compounds was then tested in a monkey model with results shown in figure three, where compounds five, eight, and 11 were particularly active to much the same degree as PGF2 alpha IE. And that is a reference, obviously, to figure three, which is on page 169. And this is another important figure. Um, it's the top figure on page 169. And it shows the reduction in interocular uh, pressure given by the various different compounds. And essentially, the good ones are the ones with longer longer bars, um, and so uh, as I've already mentioned, for example, compound 8 is pretty good, that's the tanaprost, um, and um, the asterisks are, as it says in the text, just uh, um, telling you whether or not the results are statistically uh, significant.
So then going back to the judgment, um, you've got a couple of paragraphs, 149 and 150, which um, you can skip over uh, because that's, that's a point that um, didn't really come to anything. Um, but then at the end, uh, at the bottom of page 127, we get to the critical passage, which we say has been um, misconstrued by the judge. Uh, and that's um, in paragraph, set out in paragraph 151. And what he says about it is in paragraph 152. Um, but it, in my submission, it's probably helpful to actually go back to the article to look at this passage so that my lady and my lords can see it in context. And it's to be found in Sternshanks page 170, top of the left-hand column, um, about uh, a centimetre down, there's a sentence that starts, as can be seen in table one, all phenyl substituted PGF2 alpha, i.e. analogues, bracket scheme two, induce clearly less hyperemia than PGF2 alpha, i.e. The analogues exhibiting least conjunctival hyperemia were generally those exhibiting least pharmacological activity such as the earlier mentioned um, 15 OH epimers 6-9 and the 15 keto 7-10, 17 phenyl substituted prostaglandin analogues, table one. So um, we need to um, pass this uh, passage a little bit. And um, what can be seen is that it's looking at uh, a comparison of the data in table one, which we've already looked at briefly. Um, but worth turning up again, that's at page 168, which is the data about side effects, in particular irritation and hyperemia, and it's comparing that with the uh, data which is in figure 3 on page 169, which is the data about the um, reduction in intraocular pressure, so that's whether the thing is working. Um, and uh, what what it says, um, or sorry, what, what um, one can see if one compares, and I'm going to do one example from the um, article and then I'm going to come on to the evidence where, where to be fair it's probably a bit clearer. But if, if I could ask uh, my lady and my lords to look at compounds 9, 10 and 11 at the bottom of table 1, right hand column, hyperemia, you can see that those are the best compounds as far as hyperemia is concerned. They've got the lowest results, so 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. And then you compare that with compounds 9, 10, and 11 of figure 3, which is activity. And what you see is 9 and 10 haven't got great activity, but 11 has got high activity. And so what uh, one can see from that, in my submission, without even going to the evidence, is that, in fact, um, there isn't a general correlation um, between um, high activity and high side effects. And that is why we say uh, that the judge has got it wrong in paragraph 152. Now, before we proceed directly to uh, paragraph 152, Let's just have a look at what Dr. Krauss said about this. So this Dr. Krauss um, supplemental bundle, tab two. Uh, so I'm afraid we've got rather a lot of things open, but um, yes. Yeah, so this is Alcon's uh, pharmacologist, the leader of the team. Um, and he talks about this at page uh, 28, paragraphs 136 to 138. And I'll just let my lady and my lord to read that um, for yourselves. Sorry, which, which paragraphs? 136 to 138. That's page 28 and 29 of the bundle.
So just, just to kind of pick out the um, important points from this, he's looking at the passage, which I've just taken my lady and my lord to on um, whatever page it was, but it's 151 of the judgment. Um, and he is um, comparing the data that we've looked at um, in table one uh, is the right-hand column, hyperemia. Figure three is the middle column. He's also putting in figure two, uh, the cat meiosis study, which we, which we looked at, which was that graph that we, we saw. And uh, then he's saying in paragraph 138 that there's a reasonably good correlation between meiosis and IOP lowering. So those are the two things which are telling you about the activity, um, uh, about the fact that it, it has an effect on IOP. And um, he then is uh, looking at um, the hyperemia column, and that's what he comes to next. And he says at the end of that paragraph, it cannot be said that those with the lowest efficacy have the lowest hyperemia. See, for example, compound 11, which ranks highly for cat meiosis and IOP lowering and causes some of the lowest levels of hyperemia. So that was the one I called out. We then compare that with what the judge says and finds at paragraph 152 of the judgment, which is back in the core bundle, tab 7, page 128. And as I've already said, he was looking at the same passage, which he cited at paragraph 151. He says, I agree with Alcon, this is Dr. Krauss, is their witness anyway, that this gives the impression that hyperemia was in some way correlated to activity. Well, that's not what Dr. Krauss says. It would reduce any confidence that the skills addressee could otherwise have that it would be possible to achieve good activity, matching the canopros, for example, while reducing or eliminating hyperemia. So we say that the first sentence of this paragraph uh, is uh, in error. Um, it's well, is it, are we not talking about two different things? The first is what the text says. The second is what the data shows. So what you've taken us to is a passage in Dr. Krauss yes. as to what the data actually shows. And he's clear about that. Yes. But the text in the passage quoted says something different and is not the key word in the judge's judgment, the word impression. The text, particularly the sentence, second sentence quoted, gives that impression. Why is that not an accurate account of what the text says as opposed to what the data shows? A, a few points to make on that, my lord. First of all, um, Dr. Krauss is talking about this piece of text. He cites it at paragraph 136 of um, the, the passage of the evidence that I've shown you. The text itself in the article refers to the data. Um, so it refers to um, certainly to uh, table uh, table one, and um, in addition to that, it's important to come on and see. Uh, and I'm going to do this, but um, perhaps a sneak preview is in order to see what the judge then does with this finding of 152, because in our submission, it might start as a simple reading of a passage. And my lord will say, well, that's just talking about the text and it just says impression. Uh, but the, the findings, um, for example, uh, particularly um, that at paragraph 186.5 of the judgment on page 133, and I'm going to come to some other ones as well, but as I say, this is a preview. He says at paragraph 186.5, in particular, it would be thought, for reasons explained above, that a better IOP lowering effect would be accompanied by more hyperemia. That is simply not the impression that the skilled or the understanding that the skilled person takes from the article as a whole. All right. The, the let me rephrase my question in this way. What you've shown us so far is that Dr. Krauss does what a good scientist does, which is that he doesn't take statements in a paper at face value. 
he inquires as to whether the statement made in the paper is supported by the data in the paper. Yes. And his conclusion, putting it crudely, is that this statement is in fact not supported by the data in the paper. Um, that doesn't detract from the judge's finding as to the impression, using the judge's word, as to the statement in the paper, but it might put it in a different context. So I can understand an argument to the effect of the judge has ignored the evidence as to what a scientist would make of it. I don't understand your quibbling with the finding he made about the text. Well, my Lord uh, may, may simply be putting my argument in a different way, which I would say would still work. But the point about a, a, a paragraph 152 of the judgment, which is why we say it's wrong, is that he says, I agree with Alvin, that this gives the impression that hyperemia was in some way correlated to activity. That simply isn't a, a correct reading of the uh, text of the paper through the eyes of the skilled person. And we see that from um, what Dr. Krauss says in, in his evidence. And um, he goes on to say, it would reduce any confidence that the skilled addressee could otherwise have that it would be possible to achieve good activity while reducing or eliminating hyperemia. So he, he goes on to um, place weight on that first sentence and come to a conclusion which in my, in my submission is a conclusion about uh, how the skilled addressee would read um, the paper at, at certainly this, this passage and, and, and the paper as a whole uh, and what uh, their, their overall take home message would be from the paper which is simply incorrect uh, I mean just, just I just want to draw um, out a couple of other points before I go, go on um, to explain the other uh, parts of um, Stern Chance and also the judgment where I, where I say uh, the judge has reinforced his error in this paragraph. So obviously... Um, Just before you do that, yes. could I ask you, what, what do you say the Stern Chance, the authors of this paper, were trying to say in that sentence by linking those analogues exhibiting least conjunctival hyperemia with generally those exhibiting least pharmacological activity. Why do they say it? What's the message they're trying to give? Well, my, my lord, I think one has to read uh, the paragraph as a whole, and um, so it, it's important um, to read the sentence before, uh, which in our submission um, the judge does, doesn't give sufficient weight to, so it says, as can be seen in Table 1, all female substituted analogues induce clearly less hyperemia. So the judge has just ignored that sentence, so they are trying to give a message there that they're all better than EGF2 alpha. Uh, and then, um, in my submission, they're just making a a slightly hand wavy point um, that the analogues exhibiting least conjunctival hyperemia were generally those exhibiting least pharmacological activity. And what the judge has done is ignored the word generally, and he's given this sentence far more weight um, than it should have, and that the, it, in my submission, the authors intended it to have. And certainly, he has read this entire paragraph in a way that, as we've already seen, the skilled person would not do. And obviously, it also has to be seen in the context of uh, the rest of the paper. So if uh, my Lord goes on to page uh, 173, um, bottom of uh, the right-hand column under the heading Importance of Ring Structure on the Omega Chain, um, What's said here is, from what is mentioned above, it's evident that by substituting part of the omega chain with a phenyl ring, it's possible to totally eliminate the ocular irritating effect and to markedly reduce the hyperemic effect. I apologise, I must be reading the wrong paragraph. Can you give me the reference again? Page 173, bottom of the right-hand column under the heading Importance of Ring Structure. This is in Stern Chance. So we say 
say we, that, that you have to look at the paper as a whole, and certainly the judge's conclusion, including um, the, the table and the figures, uh, including obviously through the eyes of the skilled person, including this passage here, which says it markedly reduces the hy hyperemic effect. Uh, and uh, in the light of all those things, the, the judge's uh, conclusion uh, that it would reduce any confidence that the skilled addressee could have, that it would be possible to achieve good activity while reducing or eliminating hyperemia, uh, simply it isn't correct. And as, as I've already said, he goes on uh, to sort of repeatedly f refer back to that finding, giving it more and more weight. And if I can just show uh, my lady and my lords uh, the relevant paragraphs in, in that regard. We've got paragraph 177, um, six, first of all, um, which is, that, sorry, that's on page 132 of the judgment, tab 7. So paragraph 177.6, so it's uh, towards the top of page 132. Uh, he says, although Sternshanty's results in relation to the side effect of irritation were very good, the position on hyperemia was much less clear, and there was an indication that the better the effect on IOP, the greater the, the hyperemia. It was harder to see how to, hard to see how to progress from there. And we say, um, whilst he does use the word indication, he, he's wrong to say that the better the effect on IOP, the greater the hyperemia, because again, he's reading too much into um, that uh, passage and, and not looking at it in the way the skilled person uh, looked at it. And indeed, as, as I've already said, I think it's just completely contrary to what um, Dr. Krauss says. But just to remind my lady and my lord, it cannot be said, Dr. Krauss says, that those with the lowest efficacy have the lowest hyperemia. Then we come on to paragraph 178, um, the, second, the second line. Their confidence that progress could be made with improving or maintaining IOP reduction while reducing hyperemia would be very limited. Again, we say that, that that's uh, incorrect. Um, and then we have paragraph 186.5, which, um, which, which we've already looked at, and perhaps this is the high point. Um, in particular, it would be thought, for reasons explained above, that a better IOP lowering effect would be accompanied by more hyperemia. That just isn't the take-home message that the skilled person would get from the paper. And uh, again, at paragraph 187, in the middle of that paragraph, just after the citation of authority, even had the skill team thought of trying fluprostanol in animal models to assess its possible use to treat glaucoma, they would have regarded it as very uncertain what effect it would have on side effects. Well, that, that is, again, just not a correct reading of the paper when you bear in mind that that passage is telling you that they're all better for irritation and um, that when you look at uh, table one and figure three and the way the skilled person reads the paper, you can see that there isn't an expectation that increased activity will result in increased hyperemia. And so we say that the judge's errors in those paragraphs uh, undermine the whole of um, his obvious analysis, obviousness analysis. It's peppered throughout the judgment, in particular at paragraph uh, 186 and 187, because he goes on to talk at 188 uh, when he um, addresses what the skilled team uh, would, would or wouldn't have done about the context of the overall direction of stern chance. And, and that, uh, in our submission, is again a reference back to uh, this point about what he said uh, wrongly. Uh, stern chance was telling you about the relationship between uh, side effects and um, IOP lowering. Can I ask you, 
Oh, I see what you say about 1865 and 187. 188 seems to be a separate holding. That you wouldn't you wouldn't go to the Preston Hall in the first place, and that's said to be um, based on 1861 to three, which which are quite separate points from this point. Well, my lord, we we say that it's based on points one to three, bearing points one to three in mind in the context of the overall direction of Sternschanz. So we say there's actually two elements there because points one to three are just Blue Prostanol's not mentioned in Stern Chance, essentially, and I paraphrase somewhat, but that's what those three points are. And then he's also talking about the overall direction of Stern Chance, and essentially is saying that uh, because you think that if you get IOP lowering, you're going to get worse side effects, then you wouldn't think about uh, Blue Prostanol because you'd be concerned about that. So we say it does uh, uh, permeate and undermine. Uh, the whole of the analysis that you wouldn't uh, even uh, think of uh, fluprostanol. And the other point, I mean, we have another point on paragraph 188, which is, is, is the second main ground of appeal. So we say that 188 falls, both based on that point about the context of the overall direction of Sternschanz, but also based on the point about um, what the skilled person would, would do with stern chance. And this is the point on the evidence where we say the judge has made a finding on the evidence that, that's unsupported. And so I will come back to paragraph 188 in that context. I appreciate that is an important an important judge uh, finding in his judgment. It wasn't obvious to me that, that the reference to the overall direction of stern chance was a, was a reference to the point you've been developing about how there isn't actually a very clear correlation between pharmacological activity and reduction in hydremia. But well, was more directed at, at what Stern Chance suggests you should do, which is substituting the ring at, at the end of the compound. Well, it, it, in my submission, um, it, I, I accept it's not entirely clear what the judge has in mind there, but certainly one of the points that he comes to repeatedly to do with the teaching of Stern Schantz is this point, and that he says is a concern to the skilled person, is this point about better IOP lowering effect would be accompanied by more hyperemia. So in my submission, um, that was something he was uh, talking about in, it, when he referred to the overall direction of Stern Schantz. He may have been talking about other things as well, uh, but certainly that, that is part of it. Well, except 187. There's the last point, meaning 186.5. There's some expansion, and then he goes on to expand it. Yes. And then in 188, he goes, but in any event, which does suggest that he's dealing with a different point. Well, except that he also mentions points 1 to 3, which he's already talked about in 186. No. Anyway, we have your point. Um, so, just to um, look now at um, the evidence references, because um, I, I obviously want to make sure I'm, I'm complete on this point. Um, uh, uh, our experts uh, didn't deal with this point in their uh, written evidence, but it, it was a point uh, that was put to uh, our experts in cross-examination. Um, and so I just, uh, uh, my understanding is my learned friend may rely on that. So I want to just uh, look at um, the passages that he's put in his skeleton at paragraph uh, 49 so that um, my lady and my lords can see that in context. And so that, I'm afraid, involves turning up the transcript. Um, and that is in supplemental bundle. So can we put away the paper for the time being? Uh, yes, we can put away the paper for the time being, yes. Um, I will be coming back to it Understood. in a minute. Right. And so we're, we're now looking at um, tab 9, uh, page 100. And this is the cross-examination of Dr. Redshaw, who um, was our um, medicinal chemist expert. And if I could ask 
um, my lady and my lord should just read page 243, starting at line 12, and going um, down to um, 244, line 11. As I said, this is, this is some cross-examination that my learned friend relies on. My submission about this passage of cross-examination is it simply doesn't grapple um, with the point about what the skilled reader would take away from the paper. So it puts the passage um, and it just says it's telling you this and the witness says it appears to be yes. Uh, and so it doesn't um, grapple with the point that uh, the learned judge has found about whether the, the take-home message from the paper would be if uh, that including the tables and the figures and the other passages, um, that if there is IOP lowering, you would expect there uh, to be also um, increased side effects. Yeah, uh, but the, I assume the point Mr. War is going to make is it's not what the witness says, it's what she doesn't say. So she says, the text says what it says, which is the obvious answer, but she doesn't say, but as Dr. Krauss has rightly pointed out, the data don't support it. Well, if we if we read on, there is a little bit more that it's perhaps worth worth looking at um, at the top of page two four five, um, where she does say, um, which sort of seems to contradict the previous bit that we looked at. Uh, is that important to you? Well, I mean, I was a bit surprised. Uh, and bear in mind, of course, that this is this is the medicinal chemist we're talking about at the moment, whereas this. This point is really a point for the pharmacologist, who we're going to come to in a minute. So the, the pharmacology, uh, sorry, the evidence of, of our pharmacologist is in uh, the same bundle um, at uh, page 104. So same tab even. And the part that my learned uh, friend cites, I think, is uh, page 280 of the transcript, uh, starting from uh, around line 7 and going to the bottom of that page. Sorry, which page? Page two, it's page 104 of the bundle, yes. 280 of the transcript, top right hand. 280, line seven. Yeah, line seven down to line 25. Thank you. We'll see that again. It, my learned friend just points uh, to the passage. And so again, the witness agrees that the text says what the text says. Well, he says roughly so. He's not. He's not exactly agreeing unequivocally. And then we go over to the next page, uh, one hundred and five. And if I could ask um, you to read um, on page two eight three of the transcript, uh, from line sixteen uh, down to two eight five, line four. And the 
critical lines, just uh, to make it clear, are on page 284, lines 22 to 23 of the witness's answer. Yes, sorry, my, my learner junior also points out that um, line 6, sorry, line 7 to 9 are important. This time, the, the witness or the question has moved on to mm. the latter part of the paper, page 14, as it then was. Well, I, I, d I don't think so. I may be wrong, but um, oh, you mean in at the bottom of yes, sorry, at the bottom of page 284, yes, it has. Yeah. Uh, but at the top of 284, it's vague trend there, freaking out, I'm not very impressed by that remark. And then one may or may not find irritation and hyperemia going along with the drop in IOP. That, that's right, my lords, but we do say that the point about the judge's findings, particularly the one at paragraph 186, uh, five of the judgment, is he, his take-home message from the whole paper is that you would be worried uh, about, about uh, trying, a, um, trying a compound which you knew was going to be highly active. You would be worried about the side effects. And we say that's not the correct take-home message. Can you just enlighten me on this? You, 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 you explained to us earlier that your experts, your clients' experts, hadn't uh, addressed this question in their written reports. Yes. Um, so do I understand from that that there was simply no response to the point that Dr. Krauss had made at um, paragraph 136 of his first report? I think that's right, but I, I, I'll get someone to check that just, just in case. Yes, yes, I'm told that that is correct. So that evidence, sorry, 138, I apologize, yes. I misquoted, yes. 138. So that evidence was unchallenged. Yes. Um, and the question is, where does it go? Yes, and we, we well, that, the evidence was un, uh, uh, unchallenged, and we say that um, actually... Um, it's also supported by uh, what our uh, pharmacologist said when cross-examined, so that the evidence is consistent that when you read... Well, you haven't shown us any passage where paragraph 138 was put to either of your witnesses, which is, which is why I'm a bit puzzled by all of this. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, surely the question, as I've indicated already, is what do the data show? What they, what they, how they, would the data have been interpreted by the skilled team as of the priority date. Um, and we have some rather clear analysis of the data by Dr. Krauss and a yes. conclusion drawn. Yes. The conclusion is unchallenged. Yes. But equally, so far as what you've shown us so far is concerned, it's not put to your witnesses. So where do we go? Well, my, my Lord, you have Dr. Krauss's unchallenged evidence. You have the paper itself from which um, my lady and my lords can see um, the point about compound 11. And the fact that, and also that point I took um, my lady and my lords to on page 173 and 174, um, which is that the overall, all, all those things combined, is the overall take home message is not um, that you're going to be worried about side effects if you've got um, good IOP lowering activity. So we say it's all, all falls on one side, and that my, my learned friend is clutching at straws when he shows uh, the court these passages. Can I put this to you? Um, it's true that if you look at the data, that compound 11 is a, is a good example of something which has both um, good effect on hyperemia and, and good pharmacological activity. Yes. But the authors of the paper never said there was a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, they said that generally those that, that had the least effect on hyperemia had the least pharmacological activity. Is that untrue? Well, that is true, isn't it? Well, 
Well, there, there's some kind of that, that, loose correlation. Yes, and that's what your witnesses said. That, that it's vague. It's a trend. That, did the judge mean any more than that? Well, that's something which is likely to put you off. If you think that the likelihood is that that um, the the ones with the least pharmacological activity are going to have the least effect on hyperemia, then then why why is that not something that, that could put you off doing this? Well, my lord, the po the point is that um, that's not what. Dr. Krauss said in that passage, he, he's, he doesn't say that there is that trend. Um, he, he says that he can't see a trend, in fact. And um, it, it's, uh, as I say, a point that um, the judge places very heavy reliance on. We say it's simply that, that, that short sentence general, where it says there's generally correlation just doesn't bear the weight that the judge puts on it when you read the paper as a whole and you look at what the experts said about it. Because obviously you've got to read the paper through the eyes of the skilled person. And he really does give a lot of weight uh, to this point in his judgment. Um, he doesn't say that the, a better IOP lowering effect could be accompanied by more hyperemia. He says it would be accompanied by more hyperemia at paragraph 1865. Okay, thank you. So, um, let me go back to my note. Um, I think it's time to move on to uh, the next point, not least because I'm conscious that I do have to leave my learned friend some time to speak in response. Um, and I, I just briefly um, want to continue through stern chance because um, there is some um, relevance, obviously, to the, uh, to the rest of stern chance to our. We're moving on to error two. Yes, I, well, I'm, I'm. Yes, I am moving on to error two, but slightly indirectly via just showing uh, my lords and my lady the rest of. Uh, stern chance so that you've got the whole thing in mind and I'm going to do that I hope relatively quickly uh, from the judgment again um, so the judgment bundle uh, core bundle tab 7 paragraphs 153 um, onwards um, the uh, learned judge explains um, he then moves on to the, so we've done 152, um, he moves on to the next section of the paper and um, there's an important finding um, in paragraph 154 which refers to a section of um, stern chance um, that we haven't looked at yet that the, learn, uh, that the judge makes there that the skilled person, if they didn't know about the Coleman classification, this is the receptor classification, they would look it look up Coleman to understand this part of the teaching. And that um, just so that um, you can see where that is, that's on page 170 of Stern Chants. Um, you have got at the bottom, very bot last paragraph of the right hand column. You've got the uh, passage which starts the prostaglandin receptor profile of lactanoplast has been worked out in vitro using the receptor classification system previously described. 56, reference 56 is Coleman. And um, it explains then um, over the page at 171 uh, the, the important fact that lactanoplast has high affinity and selectivity for FP receptors as demonstrated in Table 3, and these results indicate that FP receptors most likely are important in the mechanism, leading to the increased uveoscleral outflow and reduced IOP in primate and human eyes. And so um, I won't turn up uh, Coleman, um, but um, that is now in Tab uh, 12 of the Supplemental Bundle, and it does make clear uh, as I think is recorded in any event earlier in the judgment, um, that uh, fluprostanol is basically uh, the um, 
the most selective of the FP agonists, and it shows not only high potency at FP receptors, but quite rem a quite remarkable degree of selectivity. And then uh, the judgment goes on to explain that um, there are some clinical trials on the tanaprost. Um, and um, then uh, there is um, also uh, further work uh, done um, as the judgment goes on to explain. And I think we can probably um, skip over uh, paragraphs uh, 100 and uh, 55 to 158 fairly quickly, but just noting um, that there's various uh, references in that to irritative response, because we're, we're remembering our multitasking. Um, and then um, we've got um, a passage uh, starting at paragraph 159, um, which is looking at the end of the paper. And um, if I could just ask uh, my lady and my lord to, to glance through um, to the end of this uh, section at uh, 162, uh, and then we're going to look at the conclusions which the judge sets out there in paragraph 161, uh, but we can turn up at page 174 of the copy of Sternshanks. Just reading the conclusions, 174, there are two paragraphs there, and I want to draw out some points in, in that once uh, my lady and my lords have had a chance to read that. to get from, sorry, have I started too soon? No, 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 you didn't. <laughs> the critical point to get from, or to look at here, because it leads on to the second error, is the last sentence in the penultimate paragraph, um, um, so the long paragraph under the heading conclusions. The biologic activity of these compounds may, be further altered, may further be altered by substitutions in the phenyl ring. And what that is a reference back to is a reference to at the previous page where you see the heading effects of substituents on the phenyl ring. And the reason I'm drawing that point out is because we say that that uh, sentence um, is one that um, my le uh, the learned judge has wrongly read and he has read it as we'll come to see uh, being saying that you do further developments of Sternshanks when in fact all it's a reference to is work that's already been done and reported in Sternshanks at page 173. And there's obviously also a reference in this paragraph to the importance of prostaglandin receptor subtype in relation to um, side effects. So coming on to the second error, uh, and um, where this um, really appears is at paragraph 181 of the judgment on page 132, core bundle, tab 7, page 132. And the judge is 
here considering what the natural way for the skilled team to approach obvious developments from stern chance would be. And he says, in the second line, would be to consider further prostaglandin analogues altered in ways concretely reasoned out from the structure activity work described. This would be logical and routine and in keeping with the approach of the paper. It is suggested in the penultimate paragraph of the paper. Now, um, in our submission, the reference to the penultimate paragraph must be to that last line that we've just looked at in the penultimate paragraph. And that, in our submission, is a reference back to work already done in Stern Chance, as I've just shown my lady and my lords on page uh, 173, i.e. substituents on the phenyl ring. And so that is work already done by Stern Chance. It is not further prostaglandin analogues uh, reasoned out from Stern Chance. And this is where we say that the judge has made an error in reading uh, this sentence. And he has also made an error in finding that there would be more development, that what the skill team would do is the obvious step, is make more developments from stern chance. And that is entirely contrary to the evidence. And uh, we do need to go to the evidence to see that briefly, uh, starting with um, Dr. Krauss. In supplemental bundle tab two. So I think um, we can finally put Stern Chance back in the bundle now. Um, and we can go back to the supplemental bundle tab two, Dr. Krause's first report. And uh, on page 38. There's, there's a longish section here, paragraphs 234 to uh, paragraphs 240. Um, and uh, obviously, my lady and my lord should feel free to read the whole of this, but um, I'm going to just highlight the main passages now, um, which are paragraph 234. While they may discuss the possibility with skilled medicinal chemist, I also I'm sorry, do... Sorry, where, where are we? Sorry. Um, tab 2 of the supplemental bundle, page 38, paragraph 234 under the heading Structural Modifications. Um, and the key passages are, paragraph 234, while they may discuss the possibility with the skilled medicinal chemist, I also do not believe that the skilled pharmacologist would consider investigating other phenyl substituted analogues of PGF2 alpha. And that's reinforced um, at paragraph 239. I therefore do not believe the skilled pharmacologist would be motivated to investigate other phenyl substituted analogues. And if they were, it would be a local research program, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, as I say, um, there are, there are various explanations given as to um, why that wouldn't be done. But the point is that that directly contradicts the finding in the judgment at paragraph 181 that we just had open. Which is that the obvious developments from Stern Schatz would be to consider further problems in analogs. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this this is a part. This is the first report, and um, Dr. Krauss in this report that it is working on the assumption that fluprostanol is not CGK. Just to be clear. So the pharmacologist leader of the skilled team would not want to do what uh, the judge has found in paragraph uh, 181. And um, it, it's uh, not a, a point that he changed his mind on in, in cross-examination. In fact, he said, um, uh, given certain assumptions, he would try um, fluprostanol, but I'll come to that in a minute. But let me now show um, you uh, the evidence of Dr. Wilson, who was just, our Just before you move on to Dr. Yes. Wilson, um, in my bundle, I don't know if it's the same for my lords, um, in 
Dr Krauss's first report, yes. uh, someone at some stage did fall into the double-sided printing trap. Oh. Um, and so um, page 17 and 18 and 19 of the bundle actually are pages 6, 10 and 13 of the report. My lady, so, it wasn't actually the double-sided printing oh, trap. Oh, you, you didn't it think was, we needed it, didn't you? Yes, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I think we wanted everything in and the other side said no and we went along with it. Um, but that's, that's I'm fine. afraid I'm, I know, that's, I'm happy with it is that. what it is. Um, I'd skipped through it. Um, yes. So if just there want are, to check if there's something vital that I have yes, missed. Yes, I, I think I think there isn't anything vital if it's right. not in the bundle. No. But yes, that that's why. Fine. It's just that I didn't see a page saying deliberately left. Yes. Out, so yes. I'll, sorry. No, I'm not sorry. at all. Thank you. Uh, that's what's happened. Let's move there. on to the next piece of evidence. So then we've got it. Dr. Wilson, which is in uh, supplemental bundle tab six. This is uh, then uh, page ninety that we need to go to. And it's paragraphs 140 to 142. Um, they're pretty short. And um, the, the point is that this, what he says here, which is you would try to be is uh, completely consistent with, well, that, sorry, I'm putting that wrongly, but he is not saying you would try further analogues reasoned out from the structure activity relationships in Sternschanz. So in other words, he says you try fluprostanol. He do, there's no basis for the judge on either Dr. Krause's evidence or uh, Dr. Wilson's evidence to say that you try further uh, prostaglandin analogs. And the same is true in relation to Dr. Redshaw's evidence, which is our medicinal chemist. That's in the previous tab at uh, page 71, and it's paragraph 70 to 72. Again, the point here is obviously um, Dr. Redshaw is saying that you try through prostanol and not saying um, that you would um, go off and make uh, further analogues on the basis of Sternschanz. Now, just for completeness, I also want to flag up paragraph 73 in case my learned friend tries to make something of this. And that this is also cross referenced actually in Dr. Wilson's evidence at paragraph 147. She does say that if such an analogue, for example, through Prostomol, had not already been described, it would have been necessary to prepare new analogues. But that obviously isn't the position, because fluprostanol has already been described. So in my submission, um, there isn't any evidence uh, thus far in the case that supports the judge's finding. Now, um, what uh, my learned friends rely on is the evidence of Dr. Cavalla, i.e. the evidence of their medicinal chemist, and that is in the same bundle at tab 9. Oh, sorry. Tab 9, that seems to be a wrong reference. Um, sorry, it's in tab 1, page 9. Paragraphs 118 to 121. And um, what it's important to understand here is two things. First of all, the first sentence of paragraph 118, which I showed to my lady and my daughter right back at the beginning this morning, that the skilled team would be guided by the skilled pharmacologist as to whether it would be worthwhile to take any further steps. So we've already just looked at that. And the skilled pharmacologist is not saying to take any further steps, i.e. make further analogues from Sternschanz. So that's critical. 
The other thing that's critical is that um, there's then a load of evidence which might, looked at superficially, suggest that uh, this witness is contemplating doing some further structural work based on Sternschanz. But it's important to read in paragraph 18, 118, the middle bit, I understand from Bristow's that it's Dr. Krauss's evidence that there are a number of potential steps the skilled pharmacologist may take after reading Sternschanz, one of which would be to discuss with the skilled medicinal chemist whether it would be possible. Now, um, my lords and my lady, I now see the error of my ways in having whizzed through Dr. Krauss, but I can say to you that Dr. Krauss is not saying that you would take the steps. He's saying that you might discuss it, and all this witness is, is being asked to do by the solicitors is to consider those steps. He's not saying you would actually take them, and that's very important to understand. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back in reply to that if I need to, but I am, I am very conscious of time now. Um, and, and, and the point here is that um, you, uh, the, again, um, this witness is not saying they would take further steps after reading Sternschanz because they're going to be guided by the skilled pharmacologist who has said you wouldn't. Now, um, again, just for completeness, we better go to um, his second, Dr. Cavalla's second report, um, which is in tab three. And it's paragraph 39, uh, which is on page 49. And again, basically, what he's saying is he wouldn't do anything different from what's in Sternschanz. Because he'd work on the assumption that the authors in Sternschanz had already tested a number of different modifications, cited on Latanoprost's best. We also need to go to um, the cross examination, and again, I think this is because my learned friends are relying on it, but I can't quite remember. But we better do it anyway. Um, so that's in tab 10 of this bundle. And bear in mind that we're talking about the medicinal chemist here, so we're not talking about the leader of the team. And it's uh, tab 10. Uh, page 118. And if, if I could ask um, my lady and my lords to just read page 422 of the transcript, line 18, down to 423, line 12. And then also page 424, line 
page 422 is right at the bottom. So it's clear, so it's lines 24 and 25, clear that the stern chance group has deployed exactly what I am advocating, which is further modification uh, of latanoprost to see where <coughs> you go. And then down on page 423, lines 10 to 12. So they have taken this molecular modification process, which I've just suggested to you is the traditional way that a medicinal chemist would go. That is what they have done. So in other words, all he's saying is do what's already been done in stern chance. He is not saying, um, as the judge did, that uh, what you would do is consider further prostaglandin, prostaglandin analogues altered in ways concretely reasoned out from the structure of activity work described. And so we say paragraph 181 is wrong because it uh, makes a finding contrary to all the evidence of the expert that you make different prostaglandin analogues, ones that haven't been made in stern chance, and um, that that is suggested in the penultimate paragraph of the paper. And so just to be clear, the evidence of our experts was you go to fluprostanol because you know that it's a very potent and highly selective FP receptor agonist, and you've been told by stern chance that FP receptor agonists is what this is all about. And the evidence of the other side's experts was you just do what's in stern chance. You look at the compound 8, compound 11, and compound 5. So none of the expert evidence suggested that you would do something completely different. And that's why we say uh, uh, the judge has got it wrong in paragraph 181. And it's not suggested in the penultimate paragraph of the paper, because that sentence that we looked at is the sentence that just refers back to the work that's already been done. So we say, just uh, getting on to the sort of final topic on obviousness, that if the judge had not made these two significant errors, one of misreading stern chance and saying, it's going to put you off because you're going to think, if I, if I get good uh, IOP lowering activity, I'm going to have a problem with side effects, in particular hyperemia. Um, so he made that fundamental error, and then he built upon that by saying that what would happen is that the skilled person, the obvious path for them to take would be to, to further reason out structure activity relationships from stern chance, uh, a point that was not a point that was open to him on the evidence of any of the experts. And so um, his judgment on obviousness and the finding that it, it wasn't obvious, the patent wasn't obvious, is is uh, totally undermined by those two errors. And uh, why we say we would have won absent those errors, uh, I mean, I hope that this has uh, become a little bit apparent as I've made my submissions, is that in that situation where the judge hadn't made those errors, the FP receptor binding theory would have become uh, much more important to the skilled person. And so if... Um, my lady and my lords just have a look at paragraph 176 of the judgment. There is a finding at paragraph 176 that Stern Chance contains an important bulk building block in uh, the uh, obviousness argument, namely the concrete identification of the FP receptor's involvement. So the learned judge is here considering an argument uh, paragraph 175, sorry, this is bundle, core bundle, tab 7, page 131. He's considering the argument that we've just made an attack over the common general knowledge. Um, by the way, that's poorly regarded in patent circles. So it, th that's the other side of trying to say we've done that. And the judge is saying, no, he disagrees because we have got an important building block to obviousness in Sternschanz, which is the concrete identification of the FP receptor's involvement. Uh, and added to that, you've got the CGK that fluprostanol was a highly potent FP receptor <coughs> agonist. You either know that or you look it up in Coleman. Uh, you've only, in Coleman, you've only been to, got two options, fluprostanol and cloprostanol. And we say in those circumstances, it would have been obvious to try fluprostanol with a reasonable expectation of success. Now, I just need to deal very uh, briefly here with my learned friend's point that he says we had no evidence of a reasonable prospect of success. I have turned up this evidence already, but I just want to um, 
show it to my lady and my lords again. And it's in back in the supplemental bundle. This is our expert evidence, first of all, of Dr. Redshaw at tab five. And uh, we, we already looked at this on page 71. It's, it's paragraph 72, essentially. Um, in my opinion, the most straightforward approach and the most likely to lead to early success would have been to test known PGF to alpha analogues, etc. So we say we did have some evidence there of prospects of success, and we say we also had it in Dr. Wilson's uh, report in tab six, uh, page 91, uh, paragraphs 144 to 145, where he says that, in his opinion, fluoroprostanol would be the first compound to be tested. The fact that it was highly potent and selected would, ena selected would enable a relatively low concentration to be used, thereby minimising the risk of any wanted, unwanted side effects. And so we say that that is evidence that you'd expect it to work because you'd expect it to be active and you'd expect it to uh, minimise uh, side effects. Uh, and just the, perhaps the final point on this before I move on to the third error, which um, my lady and my lords will be relieved to know is shorter, um, much shorter. I hope you're not going by that clock, by the way. I'm definitely not going by that <laughs> clock. I'd like to pretend I am, but no, I knew it was 20 minutes slow. Yes, yeah. um, yeah, so the, 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 the final point um, to move on to, which, which we've already touched upon, um, was um, really the evidence um, of... Uh, the other side's experts and uh, I think I've already shown you uh, some of this evidence um, in, in particular as I understand it, stand it my learned friend relies on Dr Krause's second report which is in the supplemental bundle at tab 4 and we looked I think at these paragraphs briefly um, at the beginning of the morning but it's page 60 uh, and 61 really all the way up to 63 and this is um, where Dr Krauss um, particularly at 74.4 and 74.5 is considering fluprostanol and um, he the basis on which he is considering it is very important in this it, to understand in the second report he is considering if, if um, my lady and my lord, to look at page 61 under 74.4 in the first paragraph, he is considering four lines down uh, whether it would be better in terms of efficacy and or side effects. And he then goes on to say that they, the skilled uh, pharmacologist would have no reason to believe a more efficacious drug than latanoprost is possible. And there are further similar references to better, more efficacious etc. in the following paragraphs uh, leading up to uh, paragraph 76 on page 63 where it says for the reasons set out above I therefore do not agree that fluprostanol would be the first compound to be tested. Now the reason I'm highlighting these passages is because the point here is that really the uh, expert is looking at this from the wrong uh, perspective. His perspective is would I, would I think it would be better? If I wouldn't think it would be better, I wouldn't try it. So he's not uh, considering whether it would be one obvious route. Um, and that is, um, that is important because all that we need to show to succeed in relation to obviousness is uh, whether um, the experts would consider whether testing food prostanol was one obvious route to try. We don't need to show that it would be the first thing uh, that it would be tested. Yes, and, and it's important to... Um, remember that uh, obviously again we're, we're doing our multitasking and um, 
bearing in mind that there's uh, reference to side effects in here, uh, and there's lots of reference to side effects, and that is important when we come on to the third error, uh, which is what I'm going to do now. And so um, we now, I think, can close up with a sigh of relief the evidence bundle and go back to the judgment. And um, back in tab seven of the main judgment, we need to look at um, the uh, what, what the judge said about uh, the meaning of the claims. I've shown you the claims in the pattern. Um, what the judge said about the meanings of the claims in paragraphs 123 <coughs> to 127 on page 124. <coughs> Could I just ask my, my lady and my lords to read this, those paragraphs? paragraph is 126. In the current context, glaucoma was regarded as an incurable long-term condition. <laughs> Neither ocular irritation or hyperemia would be considered unbearable in the short term, but in the long term they would be regarded as very burdensome and were recognised as having material adverse effects on patient compliances. They were not just inconveniences. Sorry, let me just carry on to 127. I therefore consider that PGF2 alpha was not suitable for use in treating glaucoma. And um, that's essentially the, for the reasons he's explained above, which is that it's got these problematic side effects. And so we say that he has interpreted the claim here, and it's under the heading and issue of claim interpretation, as meaning that um, the uh, <coughs> compound not only has to be suitable for use in treating glaucoma because it has the effect of lowering IOP, but it also must not have the two side effects of ocular irritation and hyperemia. Now, slightly oddly, he says, uh, paragraph 124, that, that the issue of claim interpretation does not matter and does not arise. Uh, we say that that's wrong because this issue of claim interpretation is central um, to the finding on insufficiency. Um, but the important point for my lady and my lords to understand is that this um, claim interpretation has not been disputed. It's not a subject of the respondent's notice. Um, so, so my lady and my lords work on the assumption that this is the correct claim interpretation when considering sufficiency. Now, um, I'm not going to turn up the authorities, um, not least because time is short, but I'm going to just take them uh, from my skeleton argument uh, so that we can see the test that has to be applied uh, when we look at uh, this point. And I've got the, uh, we've got the legal principles starting on page, um, <coughs> well, the legal principles relevant to this point, the obviousness and sufficiency squeeze, start on page 11, uh, paragraph uh, 41, noting um, that the judge didn't cite any authorities on this. And I'd ask uh, my, lord, uh, my lords and my lady to concentrate on paragraphs 41.2 and 41.3. So uh, 41.2 is just uh, reciting the Supreme Court decision in generics and Warner-Lambert. Uh, I don't anticipate there's going to be any dispute about these um, points of law. Um, so the specification must disclose some reason for supposing that the implied assertion of efficacy in the claim is true. And um, fibrogen and akebia, whilst it's on rather different uh, facts, has quite a helpful um, series of steps that one takes 
um, to apply the reasonable prediction principle. That's just uh, what Lord Justice Burse is calling the plausibility test. Uh, first, one must identify what, what it is which falls within the scope of the claimed class. Second, one must determine what it means to say that the invention works. In other words, what is it for? Once you know those two things, the third step can be taken to answer the question whether it's possible to make a reasonable prediction the invention will, will work with substantially everything falling within the scope of the claim. So we are, to start off with, concentrating on question two, which is what does it mean to say that the invention works? And the judge has already given us an answer to that in the passage that I just took my lady and my lords to on claim interpretation. So in order to say the invention works, it must treat glaucoma and it can't have the side effects of ocular irritation or hyperemia. And then the question is, can you make a reasonable prediction, this is question three, that uh, uh, of all of these things from the contents of the patent? And here, uh, really, it's quite straightforward. There's no data at all on irritation. Um, there is as to hyperemia. And so you cannot make a reasonable prediction about <coughs> irritation. And accordingly, we say uh, the patent lacks plausibility. And we say that the judge simply didn't grapple with this point. And the place where he dealt with it is on page 135 of the judgment, paragraphs 197 to 201. So I'll just uh, give my lady and my lords a chance to read that. here on paragraphs 199 and 200 is that the judge simply doesn't deal uh, with uh, the point about irritation at all. So he doesn't deal with the law and then he doesn't deal with the facts uh, because he hasn't uh, asked himself the question of whether uh, the patent makes lack of irritation um, plausible and um, we, we obviously don't have a window into the judge's mind as to why he didn't do that. It's possible uh, that um, it's because uh, Olcon uh, didn't rely on irritation when they set out um, what it was they said was the technical contribution of the patent, which uh, my lady and my lords can see for reference at... Um, 119 to 122. Um, so in particular, at 122, it was not argued by Alcom that the technical contribution lies in whole or in part in addressing the side effect of ocular irritation. Um, but we say that is beside the point because uh, it doesn't matter what um, they particularly relied upon. Uh, we say that you have to uh, construe the claim as the judge has done and see uh, what it is um, that um, makes the invention work. And <coughs> what it is that makes the invention work is both the IOP lowering effect and the two, the, the, the hyper, lack of hyperemia and lack of irritation. And uh, so... Um, but can you <coughs> help me on this? Sec heading to this section of the judgment is obvious <coughs> stroke insufficiency squeeze. Yes. The judge refers to squeeze um, in um, 198 yes. and uh, again in uh, uh, 201. Yep. Um, so when one looks to see what he means by that, it's clear from what he quotes in paragraph 197, which is that the pleading starts in the event that the claims of the patent are not obvious yes. because it was understood that administration of PGF2 alpha would cause ocular inflammation and irritation, yes. and so on. So 
where is the finding you rely upon that the claims of the patent are not obvious because it was understood that PGF2 alpha will cause irritation? Well, my lord, there are two points here. First of all, there's what the other side rely on, and they rely on irritation in plenty of places. But then also, in the judgment, there are plenty of places where uh, the judge refers to side effects generally, and uh, also uh, refers, um, I think, to, to um, irritation. So let, let's just turn them up so we can all have them in mind. Um, there's, uh, first of all, paragraph 173, um, which is a reference to side effects generally. Um, there is then um, paragraph 177, um, 6, uh, there's a reference to sorry, side what's effects. That one? I was just rereading 173. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, what's the next one? So, 177, 6 is um, a <coughs> reference to the side effect um, of irritation and hyperemia. And 186.5 is a reference to side effects generally. Um, and um, there is also a general reference to side effects in 187. And I mean, obviously, it's important to look at how the other side uh, put the case as well. And one way in which we can see this is by looking at their skeleton argument um, on appeal. Um, and that's at tab four of the core bundle. Uh, page 49, there's a reference, several references to side effects generally at paragraph 36 of their skeleton argument. At paragraph 40, there's a reference including an uh, evidence citation to hyperemia and irritation. At paragraph uh, 42, there's another evidence reference which includes line 8 of that reference at paragraph 42, hyperemia and irritation. And at paragraph 82, um, there's a reference to side effects generally. And at paragraph uh, 89 is a reference to side effects generally at the end of paragraph 89. And paragraph um, 90 also has um, a reference to irritation in the citations at the bottom. So in my submission, it, it's quite clear that through the judgment and certainly all the way through um, the case put by Alcott, the point that they were making is you wouldn't, the skilled person wouldn't know what would happen to side effects. And they didn't just say hyperemia, they said hyperemia and irritation. And both those things, they said, knowing what would happen to both of those was problematic. And that's why uh, we say that the squeeze does arise. Just one final point that I should deal with before I sit down, uh, and that is um, my, my learned friends take a point that the evidence of Dr. Krauss, they say, uh, who said that the patent was plausible, um, was um, or it w was uh, not challenged in cross examination. Um, we say, well, first of all, let's look at what this evidence of that of Dr. Krauss actually is, and we can find that in su supplemental bundle tab two. Uh, page 41. <clears throat> um, he says, well, perhaps I can just ask my lady and my lord to read that paragraph.
Um, and, and it's important to see what he's cross-referring to uh, in that paragraph, and that is back at page 36M, so just, just before paragraph 37, page 37, we've inserted some pages. I mean, there's a long, long passage here. We don't need to go through all of it. Um, and um, if I could ask my lady and my lords to read paragraph two, one, paragraphs 214 and 215. And the, the critical sentence is the very last one in paragraph 215. And then just for completeness, the cross-examination on the point is in tab 10, page 143. This is Dr. Krauss, and it's put to him at page 518, which is the top left-hand um, page on page 143, lines 20 to 23. There's nothing in the data in the patent, is there, which enables you to tell whether fluconazole is going to cause irritable side effects. Any answers I do not believe. Uh, they showed any data on irritation. So, in conclusion, uh, we say that even if we lose on obviousness, and obviously we say we shouldn't because there were these two fundamental errors that the judge has made, it's because, although it was known that prostaglandins had a treatment effect, the barrier to treatment was side effects, and um, a great deal of emphasis was placed by Alcon in their arguments in relation to obviousness on the problems of predicting what would happen to side effects um, if you tried fluprostamol. And um, that's both hyperemia and irritation that were relied upon. And the patent simply doesn't address irritation at all. There's nothing in the patent to uh, make the uh, invention plausible um, for um, lacking uh, irritation. So, my lady, my lord, so let me just check whether those around me think there's anything else that's vital for me to say. All right, but, but can I ask you this question? Yes. Because the way you have just articulated your case, it all turns on a distinction between irritation and hyperemia. Because you say the judge dealt with hyperemia, he didn't deal with irritation. Um, yes. But was the way in which you now put it put to the judge, namely that he had to deal with irritation distinctly from hyperemia? Um, I would have to check the skeleton argument at, at first instance. I, my lady and my lord would appreciate that I didn't have the delight of being present at first instance. Um, I mean, my, my understanding is certainly that was the way it was put, but I, I better check because... Um, I don't, I'm afraid, know the answer to that off the top of my head. Well, I mean, see, see, part, learning... part, of, part of the reason for asking the question is that one question which we know did arise at trial was um, uh, that the original pleading referred to um, inflammation, and that was changed to hyperemia. Yes. Um, yes. Because it was clear that, in fact, the case was being run was, was about hyperene. Yes. Um, but um, perhaps for that reason, um, the focus of the argument, at least as the judge understood it, seems to have been all about hyperemia and not about irritation as distinct from hyperemia, which is the way you now put it. Well, my lord, uh, in my submission, the learned judge definitely knew that irritation was an important issue. Um, because he dealt with it when he dealt with the issue of claim interpretation at paragraphs 123 to 127. So he's definitely dealing with them as separate things there. Um, and as I pointed out, um, I think it's pretty clear from the teaching of Sternschatz that they're separate. And obviously he goes through the teaching of Sternschatz in great detail. 
Um, you may now recall, I'm not sure, the whichever one it was, was it table one that has two columns, one is irritation and one is hyperemia. So they're definitely, they're definitely separate things. Well, to be um, sure, that's not in dispute. No, the question no. Is, How was it put in first put? instance? Um, because if you read the judge's judgment, he seems to have been under the impression, and you may say he was in error about this, that he didn't need to deal with irritation separately. It was sufficient for him to deal with what he understood to be the primary case, namely hyperemia. He rejected that for the reasons that he gave. Uh, he evidently didn't feel that he needed to deal with irritation separately. And evidently, when uh, your side got the draft, you didn't put up a flag to say, hold on, there's a part of our case here that you haven't dealt with. Um, my Lords, I, I will undertake uh, to find out the answer to that question uh, over the short adjournment, if that's um, all right. Indeed. Can I be of any assistance to anyone else? No. No, thank you very much indeed. I'm grateful for your patience. Not on one o'clock. Two o'clock.